Uh, we're going to continue talking about Hezekiah. Anybody be encouraged by the life of Hezekiah? Anybody? Amen. Um, I found that this is absolutely appropriate in my life right now at this time. Uh, God knew the timing of everything and uh, get to put the word of God into practice. And we thank God for that. So if you were with us last week, we talked about, uh, entitled the message, Adore, Adore. And it was actually a, a play on words, Adore, but it was not Adore in the sense of, Adore, we're here for the glory of God. The word Adore means to, to, to show homage to, 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 uh, to worship, to, um, to esteem value and worth to. Um, but we used the word Adore, and Door was an acronym, D-O-O-R. Amen. And uh, we talked last week how God wants us to be doors. It says that Hezekiah, the first act of uh, responsibility that he partook in as the king of Judah when he became king at 25 years old was to repair and to uh, replace the doors. Amen. Today we're going to continue on Hezekiah. And um, when we started this message, keep your finger there in Second Kings chapter 18 and um, we're going to be back here, read this story in just a minute. And I, I want you just to keep your finger there. We will go back this time and, and go forward to Proverbs chapter 25. Proverbs 25. And when I originally started this, this series, which was um, It Is Well With My Soul, just playing on some words, Well With My Soul, we said that there were three verses in particular we wanted to look at in, in in this 25th proverb. And those three verses were verse 25, the second was verse 26, and then the third was verse 28. Today we're going to focus a little bit on 28. Before we go into those, I want to read the first verse of chapter 25 of Proverb, of Proverb 25. It says, These are also the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. So King Hezekiah at some point came in contact with the word of God. They found somewhere the writings of Solomon that he had written in the Proverbs. And from Proverbs 25 onward to the end of Proverbs 31, we see that the writings of, of Solomon were put back into publication in the days of Hezekiah. Amen? That, that he saw this as an important thing. It's always important to, to put the word of God back into your situation, back into your life, that it would be the foundation upon everything that we do. When the word of God is there, guess what? You have a foundation to stand on and you have words to encourage you to know what to do. The Proverbs are all about wisdom sayings. Amen? There, it's a book of contrast. It contrasts those who don't walk in wisdom as opposed to those who do walk in wisdom. It's the difference between a fool and the wise. It's a, the difference between the successful and the impoverished. It's a difference between those who are victorious and those who continue to fail. It, there's, there's contrast throughout the book of Proverbs, the wise sayings of Solomon. And in, the, in, in one of those Proverbs, Solomon says this, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so he gives us these wisdom sayings to let us know that this is how you should live. The foundation of your life should be the word of God. We talked a few weeks ago about the fact that God has placed a call in each of us because our life is significant. That God has placed upon us a unique calling that is individual to us. Just as every one of us has our own DNA, has our own set of fingerprints, and our eyes contain its own specific uh, design that is, that is unique specifically to us. You know, I thought it was really cool. We took to the to the zoo, and, uh, and we were looking at the zebras, and I said, isn't it really neat that every zebra's stripes are different? That every one of them, as beautiful as the stripes are to zebra, that every one contains their own unique design. Not one is the same. That God is a God of variety. Amen that even though we exist within the same species, we contain our own identity and there's a uniqueness to our life that God wants to be fully expressed. God created our life to matter. He created our life with significance. He created our life with His handiwork placed upon it, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that, that our life matters, that God wants us to fulfill our calling and the only way we can discern our calling is through the Word of God. The only way we can really live out what God has determined and purposed for us is through the word of God. God wants us to know who we are, but we can't know really who we are until first and foremost we know who he is. And thus he brings the word of God into our situation so that we know how to act at the time we need to have action. 
And so here comes Hezekiah and he puts the word of God back into practice. In his generation, he takes his men and he puts them back into publication. And these three particular Proverbs we looked at, the first one was as cold water to a weary soul, verse 25. So is good news from a far country. And we, we uh, FaceTimed in with the family and the family informed us of some good things that were happening in the nation of Israel where they are missionaries. Amen. And it's just like a cup of cold water refreshing. Every time I talk with, it's just an encouragement. Amen. Because God is working through his life every time there's a new encounter that he's having, you know? He's meeting someone new. He's, he's engaging with them. And you know he's going to share the love of Jesus with every person he contacts. Him and his wife and family. And we thank God for family. And so we did receive that good news. And then we went to verse 26. And it says, A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. And we looked at the, the decisions that we make, the choices that we make, how we equip ourselves is so significant because we will rise or fall based upon our responses to wickedness. When, when enemy op op opposition comes in, when accusation comes in, when strongholds are erected, when spewing comes out of the dragon's mouth against the church, it's at that time that we have to stand in what God has informed us in his word to do. We would be strong so that we can maintain righteous standard in the midst of wickedness and that our decisions matter because they are laying a foundation of what people see of Christ in our world today, that we are an open door. We are a book that's being read of all men. We are an epistle, a living epistle. People are reading our lives and saying, do I see Christ? Is that something that's drawing me in? Because if we're not standing in righteousness and we are bowing to wickedness, it pollutes the springs and it poisons the wells. Future generations will be battling battles that we should have won if we don't stand in righteousness. You don't realize that. The monsters and the giants that you don't overcome in your life become the monsters and the giants in your children's life and your children's and your children's children's lives. That we got to be those who stand for righteousness. And then the third verse is 28. And this is one we're going to focus in on today. It says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. He who does not have rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down and without walls. That would be our main text this morning as we go into the story of Hezekiah. So if you could turn back over to 2 Kings in chapter 18. Let me know when you're there, 2 Kings 18. You're there, all right, amen. Uh, we're going to entitle today's message, Walls. Walls, amen, or Wall. Verse 18, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3 says, And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Not many people had that testimony. Not many of the kings carried that label. But Hezekiah followed the example of his great, 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 great grandfather, David. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 4 says, He removed high places and broke down sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehishtan, which means that bronze thing, or comes from the root meaning serpent. And anyone who remembers the plague that went through the, um, the camp of the children of Israel and uh, they were bitten by poisonous snakes and death was all over the camp and the Lord told Moses to set a, a, a serpent up upon a staff and, and raise it up and everyone who looked upon the serpent up on a staff it said that they were healed of their infirmity. And uh, Jesus made reference to this when he said, as the, as the serpent was raised up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man shall be lifted up, that whoever looks upon him would have life. Amen. And it was a picture, really, of the cross, what Jesus would do. It's interesting to this day, if you look at the uh, uh, symbol for um, the medical on uh, EMTs and different things, it's a cross with a snake or, or a stick with a, with a snake around that. It's a, it's a picture of the healing that comes from Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. And the medical community often doesn't realize that that healing does not come from man's hands. Healing comes from God's hands. And it's important that we recognize and acknowledge that and everything. It still exists even to this day. The picture is still there. I want you to look at it as you see these medical uh, 
facilities, as you go into hospitals, as you look at uh, emergency vehicles, there the symbol still is. You know, it's the bronze serpent. But what happens is we can begin to idolize things rather than the one who made things for his glory. And this is what happened. They begin to bow down and worship. And Hezekiah says, anything that's going to take the, the, uh, the attention away from God is going to be removed under my kingship. And so he began to break down sacred pillars. And, and he even broke down this thing that at one time was a memorial of something that God had done, but had become a memorial that was worshipped rather than God himself. Be careful that you don't bow down to memorials. Bow down to things that God has done, and you lose sight of God in the midst of it. And this is what was happening. Verse 5 says, He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him, among all the kings of Judah, nor were before him. None like him, none before him, none like him after him. What a testimony, amen? Wouldn't you like your life to be an example to others that God was your God, that God was your focus, that God was your everything, that what God asked you to do, you were willing to stand upon his word and do it, amen? Hezekiah did this. Verse six says, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 7, the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. There was a battle going on in the days of Hezekiah. There was an empire that was rising up that was stronger than all the other empires of the world. It was the Assyrian Empire, capital of Nineveh. The the king at this time, uh, we'll see, is Sennacherib. And uh, and this this, uh, had militarily gained influence. Their power was in their persuasion to, uh, to intimidate. They came in and they, they ruthlessly destroyed nations. You, you know Nineveh and you know the Assyrians uh, basically through the prophet Jonah, if anyone's familiar with Jonah and, and the fish story. Amen? Though it wasn't a fish story, it was a true story. And, uh, and Jonah did not want to go to these people to bring about a message that would lead to their repentance because the hostility of this people was ruthless. They were, they were a ruthless people. They were a people who, you read some of the things that they did to their enemies, you say, how, how could you even do that? It's so inhumane that they would degrade and then they would destroy everything around them. They were, they were based on destruction and they wanted you to pay the price of being their enemies. Stories I could tell you, you, you just get nauseous to your stomach if I told you things that they did. They would literally skin you alive as they stuck a pole through your spinal cord holding you up while they skinned you alive breathing. They were a ruthless people. Intimidation. The devil works through intimidation. And that's what he does. If he can get you to be scared and fearful, then he'll get you to bow down to him and give him access to places he shouldn't have access to because God created us to have doors. Those doors are set to let particular in and keep others out they are they are set as as uh, points of parameters and and parameters they're they're set as a point of of uh, of necessary access that must be granted we are looking last week at doors today we're looking at the necessity of walls but it says that he did not serve the king of assyria verse 8 says he subdued the philistines as far as gaza and its territory from the watchtower to the fortified cities verse 9 now it came to pass in the fourth year of king hezekiah which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. So this is early on in, uh, in his reign, and at this time, Shalmaneser is the king of Assyria. Later, it will be Sennacherib. We'll see that in just a minute. Um, verse 11, then the king of Assyria came, uh, the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive. This is the northern tribe we looked at. At this point, Israel's been divided into a divided nation, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. The northern kingdom's Israel, the southern kingdom's Judah. Assyria had come into the northern kingdom and had scattered them completely. There was nothing left of the northern kingdom. The ten tribes that had departed off from uh, following under Solomon's son Rehoboam. Verse 12 says, Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded, and they would not hear them nor do them. So because of disobedience, the children of Israel, the northern kingdom, were not willing to listen to God. They weren't willing to walk in his ways, and therefore they became a prey of the enemy. How many people know that when you don't walk in the ways of God, that you're fighting for yourself? And when an enemy that comes in is stronger than you, you lose. How many people know there's no enemy that's stronger than God? Anybody attest to that fact? There's no enemy stronger than God. When God's on your side, victory is sure. But when you turn away from God and you say, God, I got this, you're in a whole lot of trouble because you'll find that your enemies are stronger than you. Sometimes people try to rebuke the devil in their own power. And I say, you got to be very careful in that because the devil's a lot stronger than you are. If it weren't for the grace of God and work in your life, then you would be in a whole lot of trouble. 
remember that your authority comes not within your own self-attained righteousness. Your authority comes only in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is granted through his shed blood for us. Amen. Maybe with me today. Amen. And then we go on to verse 13. And in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah, and he took them. Anybody in a battle today? Anybody find that the enemies are pressing in, that you're in a, in a, maybe in a, a point of conflict, that you feel like there's pressures in your life that you've never felt before? Maybe that you're fighting some enemies that are stronger than any many enemies you've ever faced before. Anybody can attest to that fact that you might be in a battle right now, that you're in a battle against some very strong enemies, some enemies that are intimidating? And not only are they strong, they talk a lot. And the more they talk, the more fearful you seem to become. When their accusations come in, how many people know that the devil works through enemies to try to distract us and deter us away from who God is? That if, God, if our eyes can be taken off of God, then right in that, in that moment, we become a prey to the enemy. Because if we are resting within our own strength and power, when we look around and say, oh no, I don't know if I've done enough good to please God, and therefore God couldn't possibly be on my side. And then the enemy comes in and brings those accusations, those accusations, those accusations, which ultimately draw you further and further away from God, thinking that he's upset or mad at you. And it brings you into this place of trying to figure things out on your own. How many people know that we cannot really know what to do apart from a work of God's grace? If it weren't for the word of God, we'd be left to ourselves. And guess what? The ways of man are wrong. Amen? Amen. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all wandered off and gone after our own way. There's none that does good. No, not even one. Amen? There is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end of that way is death. There's a way that seems right, but the end of that way is death. And so we see that this is what's happening. There's an enemy who's coming in, and now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, he's moved in. Not only has he now destroyed the northern kingdom, he's now moving into the southern kingdom, the jurisdiction of Hezekiah. The enemy's coming in. He's thinking to myself, what can I do to keep him out of here because I don't want him coming and destroying me. You ever seen the devil wreak havoc in someone's life who was... You weren't sure if they were walking in obedience or not. You just kind of figured they're the people of God. They should be walking in victory. And all of a sudden, their life was just demolished. And fear kind of began to instill in your life. Have you ever seen that before? How do you know that sometimes the devil works through sickness? Sometimes he works through financial trouble. Sometimes he works through losing of a job or a family member or someone who's stumbling through a child, a lot of times through parents. And, and the devil will work in all these different ways to try to distract us and to say, hey, guess what? The, they weren't strong enough. You're not strong enough. I'm going to come in and just as I did to them, I'm going to do to you. And the devil comes in in intimidation. That's the way the devil works. Verse 14 says, Then King Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I've done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I'll pay it. Can I just say something real quick? Don't make a bargain with the devil. I said, don't make a bargain with the devil. S too many Christians make bargains with the devil. Hey, listen, I'll, 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 I'll stay out of the matter if you just not bother me. It's like we make a deal with the devil. We're afraid. So many people are, are locked up in fear. If I don't get too serious about my commitment to Christ, maybe the devil won't bother me. Well, if I don't get engaged in active ministry, maybe the devil won't really pay attention to me. It's like we make deals with the devil thinking that if I, if I don't do, you know, if I don't bother him, he won't bother me. I want some people who are willing to bother the devil. I just want to say that from the get-go. I want some people who are willing to, to get involved in some stuff that will, will gain the attention of the enemy saying, hey, listen, we don't like what you're doing. That's too bad. I didn't ask your permission. Amen? Is anybody with me today? Because if this is what God wants me to do, I don't have to ask the devil's permission. He might not like it, but he doesn't have to give me permission. If I'm walking in my own strength, I'm in trouble. But if I'm walking in the grace of God, he is. And that's what we've got to understand. But King Hezekiah, he's seeing what's happening to the nations around him and now to his older brother nation. And he's looking, he's thinking to himself, this isn't really very good. So he sends down to Syria and says, hey, I'm sorry if I disturbed you. I'm sorry if I haven't really done what you wanted me to do. If you wanted taxes from us, we'll pay taxes. Verse, uh, and then it says, whatever you impose on me, I'll pay. And the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And now he's imposed upon him taxes. Too many Christians paying taxes today. Let me just say that. And I don't mean that in the sense of to the government. I'm saying to the devil. Don't get me wrong on this. Christians should be paying their taxes, rendered to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is too much of our life is occupied and give the devil what he wants because we're scared he's going to get involved in our stuff. I'll sit down in complacency if you won't bother me. Anybody with me today? 
It's like, I, I don't want to get too serious about my prayer life. I don't, fasting, I don't know about fasting. And so he begins to buy in the 14th year. Remember 14th is a very significant number? It's that double perfection. Guess what? I told you the word of God is right and true and will be fulfilled. Everybody said amen, right? God will fulfill his word. Amen. Guess what? That's not always good news if you're not walking in obedience. I said it's not always good news if you're not walking in obedience because God said what he said he will do. In other words, if you're not doing what God said you're supposed to be doing, he's going to do what he said he would do regardless of what you're doing. So if that means that you're in a disobedience, it means his word will be fulfilled in your life that you will not prosper in disobedience. You will only prosper in obedience. You hear me? God's word is faithful and true. When we are faithless, God remains faithful. Some people say, well, that means I can be faithless. God will continue to bless me. No, it means this, that God will be faithful to his word even when you are faithless to his word. His word still holds true and has authority and power. So in other words, when you break his word, you will suffer the consequence. When you walk in his word, you will walk in the blessing. But God will be faithful to his word. Everybody with me today? Amen. Make it plain. And uh, verse 15. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. And that time Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. I said, what is Hezekiah doing? Do you remember last week we talked about the fact that in the first month of the first year of his kingship, he began to repair the doors. He was setting himself up for a victorious kingdom. He was setting one up that God would be honored. It says of Hezekiah that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He did all that was in accordance with David, his father. Now 14 years into it, we're at a crux of the matter. We're at, a, we're at a crossroads within his life. How many people know that we walk through seasons? Sometimes we have victory and we go from victory to victory, but the warfare doesn't end. We have one enemy after another. We are never going to be free from opposition. We're never going to be free from accusation. We have to walk in faithfulness to the word of God. It's necessary that we have a foundation in our life so that we know how to live. And so these sayings were put into practice probably just at the right time. And so he starts to strip doors, gold off the doors, and starts to give them to the king of Assyria. Hey, if we give you what you want, you won't bother us. That's not true. We've got to understand this is we're suffering the consequences in the church today. When we bow the knee for what we would call peace, Jesus said, peace, peace, but there's really no peace. Because I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. The reason I came was not for you to live in luxury. The reason I came was you to fulfill your calling. Let me say that again. The reason I came was not for you to live in luxury. The reason I came was for you to fulfill your calling. Amen? Amen? Verse 17, the king of Assyria sent the Tardin, the Reb Saras, and the Reb Shak from Lachish. These are three of his highest officials. With a great army against Jerusalem to King Hezekiah. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they had come up, they went and stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool, which was on the highway, the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to them. Then Rabshak said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? And so Rabshak is the, uh, he's the, he's basically the ambassador for the king. Uh, he, he's the prince uh, that, is, that is appointed by, uh, at this point, King Sennacherib. And he's going to come as the mouthpiece of the Assyrian empire. And he comes and he says, What confidence is this in which you trust? Verse 20, You speak of having plans and power for war, but they're mere words. So we could see that a transition had happened, that Hezekiah had bought into the lie to, to, to give in to peace by surrendering things that were rightfully his, that God had given him. Be careful what ground you give up. Don't give up ground to the devil. There were other times we see in, in, in the histories of kings that they invited. In fact, there was a particular king that invited the, the king of Babylon into his uh, treasury and showed all the treasures of the house of the Lord and, uh, and the prophet comes and says, hey, what'd you show him? He said, I showed him everything. And the prophet said, well, everything he's going to take out into another land. Because you let him cross through doors that he had no right entering into. You let him take ground that he had no right stepping on. See, you trusted in the, in the, in the wisdom of man, but you did not trust in the strength of God. And therefore, you're going to have to suffer the consequence of disobedience, of faithlessness. And so here's what happens in, in verse 20. He now takes a turn and, and says, no, we're going to prepare for war against these people. And he says, you speak of having plans and power for war, but they're mere words. And in whom do you trust that you may rebel against me? 
This is the Rav the, the, the voice piece of the king saying to the children of Israel, what are you going to do? How are you going to stand against me? What strength do you have to prevail against me? Verse 21, now look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. So what's going to happen now is Hezekiah is thinking through his natural mind and making plans to ally himself with other nations to try to protect himself now from the Assyrian invasion. Don't align yourself. The Bible says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship is there between the children of God and, and infidels, unbelievers, a believer and an unbeliever? Is there any fellowship? Is there any agreement at all? There's none. That you don't make business partnerships with unbelievers. That your agreement and your partnership is based upon your faith in Jesus Christ first and foremost. Amen? Have you with me today? That you've got to be careful. The Bible says that you don't, join, you don't equally join yourself together with an unbeliever. You don't. That you have to be joined together with a believer in faith, not aligning yourself with others that you think are going to help you out. You don't operate in the arm of flesh. When you operate in the arm of flesh, you will suffer the consequence of flesh. But when you put your faith in God, God will give you the victory in every situation as your eyes are upon him. I want you to understand that. This is something I'm living in right now. That I have to understand my eyes have to be upon God. If you begin to try to work things out in the natural, you are resting in the arm of flesh and you will get only what the flesh can do. The flesh can only do so much. But when you trust in God, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that's at work within us. More than we could ever imagine God is able to do. Anybody with me today? He says, in fact, trusting in Egypt, and he, he begins to accuse him. He says, this is what it's like. It's like trying to rest yourself on a, on a stick that's been broken. And when you rest on it, it pierces right through your hand. You thought it was going to be something that helped you hold your weight up, but it's going to be something that actually inflicts wound to you. This is what the words of the accusation that's coming against him. And then verse 22. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away? And said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. And now he brings to bring accusation against Hezekiah according to the reforms that Hezekiah previously had made. He took down all the high places. He took down the bronze serpent. He took down all the places of, of, of idolatry. And he destroyed them all. He decimated them. Amen? And now the, the enemy comes in and says, listen, you, you, you're going to trust in the Lord? He's removed all his high places. How many people know the world believes that all gods are the same? All religions are the same? All roads lead to the same entrance? Basically, that's what he's saying. He tore down the Lord's altars, but in reality, he didn't tear down the Lord's altars. He made a road for the Lord. It's not every way leads to heaven. Not all roads are the same. There is only, in fact, one door. The only door is Jesus. Amen? Everybody with me today? There's only one way to eternal life. There's only one access point to the Father. It's through the person, Jesus Christ. Anyone who comes in any other way, he's a thief and a liar. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come, Jesus said, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. When you enter through the door, abundant life is granted to you. But when you try to make all roads the same, you have no life at all. You're walking in a, in a road that's filled with robbers and thieves. And you'll find yourself impoverished on that road. There's only one way. It's the road that's called Jesus. Amen? And then verse 23, Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I'll give you 2,000 horses if you're able on your part to put riders on them. And he basically says that if you do what we want from you, we'll empower you to come alongside you. We'll do what's right. And he began to, to just cry out. Let's just keep reading for a moment. Everybody okay still? Uh, verse 23, Now therefore, uh, verse 24, Now, then you will repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen. He's saying, are you going to trust Egypt? Verse 25, have I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now he's saying, God's on my side. How many people know the devil will do that? It's almost like some of you done, made decisions in your life or done things in your life, and now the enemy's come and saying, God's actually against you. God's fighting against you. God wants to destroy you. God's on my side. The devil's like convincing you God's on his side, and God wants to destroy you, and you're running further and further away from God, and the devil's laughing the whole time. How do you know that? That's the way the devil works. He's going to try to get you as far away from the word of God as possible because the word of God is the only thing that will give you a foundation to stand on. It's the only way in which you can decipher the call that's on your life, a call that's full of life. Amen? We keep reading here, verse 25, uh, uh, verse 26. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rev Shach, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it, and do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. And now he's actually speaking these things in the, in the earshot of all the people that are standing on the wall of Jerusalem. And so the, the officers of King Hezekiah's courts are saying, hey, why don't you speak in your own language so no one knows what you're talking about? Because we don't want you talking Hebrew. We don't want them hearing what's going on. 
And this is what Rabshakeh says in verse 27. Then Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? The King James uses a little bit more uh, graphic language. And it, verse 28 says, Then the Rabshak stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and spoke, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you from this hand, nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to King Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, Make peace with me by a present and come out to me, and every one of you shall eat of his own vine and his own fig tree, and every one shall drink the waters of his own cistern. What promises the devil makes? Until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive groves, of honey, that you may live and not die. But listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. What he's basically saying is this, that we'll give you exactly what you want if you just serve us. The devil will make everything look real good. Verse 33, has any of the gods of the nations been able to deliver the land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath, the gives Arpad? Where are the gods of Seraphim, the Hina and Iva? Indeed, they have delivered... Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? He's saying, basically, no, one can, no one's going to be able to keep you from us. You might as well make an alliance with us. If you can't beat them, join them. That's the way the devil works, folks. Verse 35, who among all the gods of the land has delivered their countries from my hand? The Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Do not answer him. Scroll through here for one second. The Lord comes and speaks through the prophet Isaiah in verse 6, chapter 19. And Isaiah said to them, Thus, says, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Then the Reshek and returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish, and the king heard concerning Turka, king of Ethiopia, look, he has come out to make war with you. So again, sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given to the hand of the king of Assyria. And the Lord continues to work a work and fight the fight for king Hezekiah as he keeps his eyes upon him. Verse 14 says, And Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, said, O Lord, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and you've made earth. So I want to read that whole story with you this morning just to give you a context of, of what's going on here. That basically the devil's come in because he's an accuser. He's a blasphemer. He's a slanderer of the, of the, of the, of the brethren. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's boastful, he's proud, he intimidates, he brings fear tactics, he spews out lies, he convinces you that his, his accusations are sure. He will intimidate you by many different things. He'll come against you in a multitude of different ways and he'll do everything in his power to try to get your eyes upon him by taking them off the only living God. That's the way the devil works, folks. So how do we deal with accusation? Because we looked in, in, in this first verse that we read, Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And Hezekiah was going to have to live this out. That if you don't have a rule over your own spirit, you're like a city broken down without walls. Guess what? A city without walls is prey to anyone and anything. In fact, last week's message means nothing if you don't have any walls. Because anybody ever seen a door without a wall? Anybody ever seen a door without a wall? I saw a picture of a, it was a sidewalk and there was a gate over the sidewalk, but there were no wall, there were no gates around the side on the grass. Like, like that gate was going to pe keep people away from walking to the left or the right around the gate. The door it doesn't serve its function unless there's walls. Mm. Amen? Amen? And it says that a person who has no rule over their own spirit is like a city that's broken down and has no walls. I want you to just look at this for one for a few moments before we close this morning. Everybody still okay, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen? Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. The word rule in the Hebrew is the word matzar, and it means restraint or control. Whoever doesn't have control or restraint over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. 
that, that word matzah here in Proverbs 25, 28 is the only place in all of the scriptures that it's used. It's one occurrence in all the scriptures. It comes from the root atzer, which means this, to restrain, to retain, to close up, to shut, to withhold, to refrain, to stay, or to detain. And the word spirit is the Hebrew ruach. Ruach. It's the same word that's used for the spirit of God as the spirit of man. The spirit of man and the spirit of God are the same word, ruach, breath. It's just as in the New Testament, it's pneuma. In the Old Testament, it's ruach. It's, it's literally the breath of God, the breath of life. That there was no life until God breathed the ruach, the life into a man, and then he became a living being. It's the being of us. It's who we are. It's, it's, it's really, it's in our inner man. It's, it's the person who we really are our spirit. And it says, if you don't have any rule, if you have no restraint, no control, you don't have any detaining or closing up or shutting or withholding within your own spirit, you're like a broken down city without walls. So few people actually are able to exercise self-control. At the first time that something goes outside of what we wanted, we, we are just thrown into this chaotic state. That we immediately get down, we immediately go into fear, we immediately go into depression, we go into all these different places, we have no control over our own spirit. How many people know that God wants us to have the ability to control what is going on internally? To be able to close up, to be able to shut up, to be able to detain and refrain from being able to give in to all these things that are coming because when the devil comes in with all this attack, the immediate response is to try to, to, to respond or react, actually. React is probably more the right word. We need to learn how to respond, but our, our, our basic instinct is to react how many people react someone punches you and then you afterwards you think about it someone yells at you and you you react we become a very reactive people you notice that i mean we have a school teacher here and how many fights take place in the schools there's no there's no restraint there's no restraint we live in a generation where there's no restraint no one knows how to control. We've lost all levels of restraint. We, we're living in a time right now, there's no walls. There's no walls, folks. So our doors are ineffective. There's no walls. There's, it's a broken down city. It's a city that's broken down. Hezekiah, if you remember, that he started his kingship saying, listen, we're going to re-erect. We're going to set up again the boundaries. We're going to set up again the house of God. We're going to reinstill the purposes that God has set for his people. We're going to set up doors on these walls so that there's an effectiveness, that there's a monitoring, that there's a, a guidance, there's a direction that we know what's coming in, what's going out. We are setting up what comes into our life and what goes out there's no restraint in this generation we watch anything we listen to anything we say anything we do anything we experiment with everything we wonder why we never have any victory in our lives how do we find a freedom from accusation this morning i want to look at the word wall with you at the moment am i still okay let me just read this first proverbs 16 32 says this he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than the one who takes a city in other words that you are better and more victorious than a great conqueror if you have control over your own spirit. That if you have control, in fact, one of the fruits of the spirit, the last of the fruit of the spirit mentioned is temperance or self-control. A person who has control over their own self, control over their appetites, control over their desires, control over their responses, that we need to be a person who's in control. In a generation that's lost control, we have no ability to say no. There's no no. No one could say no. If we say no, then something else is dangled in front of us. Say, oh, you know, my, my, my sister-in-law jokes sometimes. Say, come over to the dark side. We have cookies. Or come over to the dark side. We have this or the other thing. And it's a funny joke, but it's the truth. Come over to the dark side because if, if we can't convince you by accusation, we'll, 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 we'll beckon you over with promise. And no one has any control to say no. We wonder why there's so many STDs. We wonder why so many people are hooked on drugs, prescription, and, and illicit. We wonder why so many people are in broken down relationships. We wonder why people have no control over their mouth. They just say anything all the time. They can't say no. They can't hold back anger. They can't hold back their feelings. It, we wonder why relationships are continually fragmented and broken down because there's no control in our generation. Is that yes or no? In Daniel 5.20, when... Um, it says when Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up, his spirit became hardened in pride and he was deposed from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him and he went out and lived in a field like a, like a beast because a spirit of man can become hardened in pride. A spirit can become hardened in pride. This morning I want to tell you how you deal with accusation and the words walls. The title of this message today is Walls. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these things down. 
This is how you resist accusation. This is how you set up walls within your life. Because walls are needed in our life. This is, we want to be a walled city. We don't want anybody to be able to come in. We want to have control over our spirit. Amen? We want to have control over our spirit. We want to know when to speak. In fact, Hezekiah said to his men, when they come in with all these accusations, don't say anything. When you don't know what to say, don't say anything. When you think you know what to say, keep your mouth quiet. We have an example that's been given to us. If you remember even the days when Joshua led the people out to find victory over the walls of Jericho, he said, for six days I want you to walk around the city, but don't say anything. No words to be spoken to each other or to anyone around you. No words would be spoken. I want you to learn that if you would have restraint, walls would bow before you. If you would have restraint, walls would come down before you. You would be a walled city, but no one would be able to stand against you. If you would have control, if you could learn to control your tongue. James says this, a man who has control of a tongue, he's a perfect man. A perfect man. A perfect man. Because a tongue is controlled by our spirit. If we can have control of our spirit, if we can learn how to speak based upon what God has said, we would be victorious. And be with me today. Too many of us speak out of fear and not faith. God wants us to be a people who can proclaim the truth of what he said. Walls. W. When Hezekiah started his reign, the first thing he did was begin to reinstitute temple worship. The word is worship. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 29, starting in verse 20, leading up into chapter 30 of 2 Chronicles, it says that two things became the main agendas of Hezekiah when he became king. One was to restore temple worship, and the second one was to reinstitute the Passover worship. If you're going to have set up boundaries and walls to be able to withstand accusation of the enemy, the first W is going to be worship the Lord. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Worship the Lord. And which leads us to A. He wants us to annihilate idols. Annihilate. Not just take down, but to annihilate. I want to use that word. I want to emphasize that word today, annihilate. You know what annihilate, annihilate means? It means to utterly destroy. In 2 Chronicles 31 and verse 1, it says that Hezekiah destroyed, destroyed all the high places, all the places of worship that had previously deterred the people of God away from worshiping the Lord only. All those things that had become resting points, all those places that had become places of, you know, I believe in God, but this is my comfort. I believe in God, but this provides me a, a little bit of this or that and the other thing. God wants us to worship the Lord only. Can you say only? Only. He wants us to annihilate idols that have been erected within our lives. Maybe from previous generations. We know from previous messages here that Ahaz, uh, uh, Hezekiah's father, was the worst of all the kings of Judah. He was an idolater. His grandfather wasn't too much better. He had lived in idolatry. That was the pattern that had been set for him. But he had to know something, that it might have been the, the, the behavior of those who previously walked before me, but I'm going to walk annihilating the past, annihilating those things that were stumbling blocks, annihilating. You don't be comfortable with sin. You don't be comfortable with the things that lead you away. You don't be comfortable with a minimized, a small view of what God is like. You get an enlarged view of God and you annihilate idols. Amen? Annihilate idolatry, which brings us to L. You need to let go of old patterns. I said you need to let go of old patterns. You're still in Second Kings and, and uh, chapter 18. I want to read... Just three verses here. Verse 13, in the 14th year, king of Assyria, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, Assyria, came in against the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I've done wrong, turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I'll pay. And the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave all the silver that was in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And that time Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. You need to, what? Let go of old patterns. I said you need to let go of old patterns. This might have been the example that was set by his father and his grandfather, but God was saying, I need you to let go of old patterns. You need, not, you need not follow the example that's been set before you naturally. You need to walk now in what the word of God has been laid out before you. If you're going to have a rule over your spirit, you need to let go of old patterns. I said you need to let go of old patterns. That takes a renewing of the mind. That takes a surrender of your life to God as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. You need to lay yourself down before the Lord and have your mind renewed. We need renewed minds so that we can let go of the old patterns of behavior. Some of us instinctually move in a particular direction when hardship comes in. God wants that instinct to be cut off. 
He wants us to develop new instincts. He wants our immediate response to be turning our eyes to the Lord and not turning our eyes to other things. Let go of old patterns. The, the second L is this. He wants you to learn to lean on the Lord. To lean on the Lord. In chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, the, the accusation of the enemy says this. Now look, you're trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt on which a man leans. It will go through his hand and puncture it or pierce it. He doesn't want us to lean on other allies. He wants us to lean on the Lord. He doesn't want us to lean on the things we've been accustomed to. He doesn't want us to lean on other people. He wants us to lean on the Lord. If you want to be free from accusation and be a firmly established city with walls around it, he wants you to learn your first and and primary focus is to lean on the Lord. When the devil begins to lean in and pressure an accusation, you learn to lean on the Lord. He's your first defense. He's your only defense. Learning to lean on the Lord. Amen? Which brings us to S. Walls. This message is titled today, this morning, Walls. And it's this. It says in 2 Kings 19, verse 14 and 15. Turn there. I'm almost done, so don't worry. And this is it. So you need to worship. You need to annihilate. You need to let go of old patterns. You need to lean on the Lord. And S, you need to spread it out before the Lord. You need to spread it out before the Lord. Here it is, 2 Kings 19, verses 14 and 15. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers. He read it, and, he, and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. And then he says, Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which have been sent as a reproach against the living God. If we would learn to spread it out before the Lord, guess what? We would learn to walk in victory. If we would learn to spread it out before the Lord, he said he received the letter of accusation. He received the letter. He went into the house of the Lord, laid it out before the Lord, and he laid out before the Lord, said, Lord, only you can deliver. Only you can respond. But I want to remind you who you are, God. I'm not reminding you, I'm reminding me. You're the God who dwells between the cherubim. You're a God who's made himself known to his people. You're the God who dwells in the holiest of holies. You're the God who dwells in the house of the Lord that's been erected, that's been put within my heart to reestablish. God, you are my God. You are God of this kingdom. And when this ac accuser comes against this kingdom, God, he's not accusing me, he's accusing you. And I just want to remind you, you're the living God. Who could stand before you, God? Who could do anything God against you and God sent a spirit upon him and he went back to his own land because when you walk in the spirit they'll walk in the spirits and the spirits will deceive them and you will walk in truth you will have walls and their walls will fall you will walk in victory and you will have tremendous joy with your head bowed this morning I want you to have walls folks I want you to have walls amen because many are going through some times right now, the accuser of the brethren has come. He accuses not day and night. He accuses the saints. But I want you right now to say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to worship you. I want to remove idols. I want to let go of old patterns. I want to lean on you, Lord. And I want to spread my life out before you as a sacrifice. I belong to you. The battle belongs to you. This is not my fight, Lord, it's yours. Because this life is not my life, it's yours. It's been purchased at a great price. And right now I'm relinquishing control back into your hands, oh Lord. Can you do that this morning? I'm giving you back, Lord, this life that belongs to you. I want to be a walled city so that I can function in my operation as a door. Amen. Lord, once again, surround this city. Not just anyone can come in. Not just anything can come in. Not anything can come and disrupt the spirit. The spirit will remain strong. I will not be a broken down city with no walls but I shall be strong in the strength that is provided by God. These walls shall be around my city. Walls, walls called salvation and gates which are called praise. I will learn to control my tongue, O oh Lord. I will not be loose with my speaking. I will not speak death over my life. I will speak life. When it takes time to, to talk, Lord God, I will be quiet before the accusers and I'll come into your presence, O oh Lord. And I'll learn the example of my Lord and Master when he was accused. It said he was like, led like a lamb to the slaughter and he opened not his mouth. He opened not his mouth because he had control of his spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray today, Lord, that you'd reveal yourself to every heart and every life today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.
as we close this morning, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus Christ personally this morning, I want you to show you something. There's one who's ever had control fully upon his spirit is Jesus. In Matthew chapter 26, and we're getting ready to, to celebrate Passion Week. We're moving towards what we call Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's a reason why he died. He died in fulfillment to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin, to be the one who would reconcile man back to God. When Caiaphas, who was the high priest at that time, he had arrested Jesus and he had brought Jesus before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, they were the, they were the ones who, who instilled the law and instituted the law and they were the ones who were the bigwigs of that society. They, they had basically rule over the, the Jewish community and they, they were, they guess it probably about 71 of them and they sat in this semicircle and they brought in those that they would accuse and they would intimidate them and, and begin to instill fear within them. They brought Jesus and they placed him on, on trial and they began to accuse Jesus and it says Jesus didn't open his mouth. He opened not his mouth. He had control over his spirit. He did not need to speak. God was going to be the one speaking for him. He had full control. And the high priest stands and looks at Jesus and begins to ask all questions. And Jesus doesn't answer anything. He doesn't say anything. Listen, some of us talk too much because we have no control of our spirit. And we wonder why we're constantly fighting battles we can't win. And the high priest looks at Jesus and says, I put you under oath. I put you under oath. Let's read it for one second as we close here. I want you to see this. Because Jesus remained silent. Matthew 26. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance for the high priest's courtyard. And he went and sat in the servants to see the end. And now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses, they came forward and just said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it again in three days. And the high priest rose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered, said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. They thought they had him trapped. If he claimed equality with God, that he was God incarnate, they were going to put him on trial for death for blasphemy. And now by being put on oath, if he remains silent, he himself would be accused of sin, according to Leviticus chapter 5. Under trial, if they were put under the, the condition of oath, they were required to give an account. At this point, he had remained silent in accordance with what Isaiah 53 said. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb who opened not his mouth, who was dumb before its shearers. So Jesus. But now here he is, not opening his mouth against false accusation that had actually been paid to falsely accuse him. How do you know the devil's a liar? And he'll lie and he'll lie and he'll lie about you to the point where you start to begin to believe the lies. And he'll lie and he'll lie and he'll lie and he'll lie. And high priest says, I put you under oath now. Are you going to remain silent? What? Is this true? Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? By being put on oath, according to Leviticus chapter 5, if Jesus at that moment became and remained silent, he would have been a lawbreaker, and therefore he could not have been the just judge to redeem us of all our sin. Can you imagine that? His silence led way only to speech because the high priest thought that he had Jesus trapped, but what Jesus did was show that he was the only one who had a true working knowledge of the Scriptures. And he quotes Daniel, and he says this, Verse 64, Jesus said to him, It's as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And what he did was prophetically say this. Listen, God's going to get the last word. You think you're going to win by hanging me on a cross, but guess what? I'm going to be coming riding on the clouds because I didn't come just to die. I came that they might live and live not just for a little while, but forever. Jesus came that we might have life eternal. Folks, Jesus, the one who against accusation could stand silent because he could control his spirit and when thought to be forced into a position to talk, spoke that which was wise because he stood on the word of God. He was the word of God revealed and said, this is the way it is. I will become riding on the clouds. Do you know how awesome Jesus is? Can I encourage you this morning? Just put your life in Jesus' hands. You're sure to win. 
when Jesus is on your side. There's nothing to stand against you. We looked at this a few weeks ago in Syria. A spirit comes upon him. He goes back to his own land. 186,000 of his soldiers are wiped out by one angel. You know God's got angel hosts? And one angel could take scores of the, the vilest and the, and the most sophisticated of enemies. It just takes one angel to wipe them all out. And God's an angel army host. Amen? Do you know how much power is on our side? Do you know how much victory is in our court? If we would just say, Lord, I lay it all down to you, worship you, annihilate all the thoughts that are contrary to you, break down all these small images of what you're like, Lord. I let go of old patterns, old thought processes, old behaviors. I let go of all the old. I, I want a new creation, Lord Jesus, because that's what you promised. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and everything has become brand spanking new. Would anybody like a brand new start today? Just put your hands up to the Lord. Say, here we go, Lord. I'm going with you. I'm going on with you. I just entrust my life to you, Jesus, right now, Lord. I acknowledge you, Jesus, that you died. You died for me. You died for my sin. You live now. You live now in heaven, always praying for me. You pray for me, Lord. And when you come back, Lord, you're coming back for me, Lord. I want that to be my testimony because I want to live, Lord, for you. I want to live for you, Jesus. Can you just say it this morning? Go stand on your feet.